Hi, I'm Philip Anthony Albertelli, and welcome to The Week in Doubt, Episode 10, Hidden Hands. Let's see, before I start, were there any apologies or corrections to take care of? I think there was one thing. Um, it may have been just the last episode or the last two episodes, but either way, while well, listening back, I caught myself accidentally using the phrase books of Genesis instead of book of Genesis. Now, that might sound like um, a minor correction, uh, but if you're a fan of the show, and hopefully there's some of you out there, uh, there must be, <laughs> because we're up to over a thousand episode hits now. Now, I don't know if that's just Podbean or if that also includes uh, iTunes hits as well. I'm just going by the episode hits number um, in my Podbean dashboard. But anyway, if you've been listening all the while, then you probably know I have a neurotic need to correct myself. And as I said on at least one other occasion, my need to correct myself is probably twofold. On the one hand, to be honest, it's probably ego-driven. Uh, I just don't want to get ripped apart online for <laughs> incorrect information. And secondly, it's um, driven by, I, I think, an honest sense of responsibility that if I'm going to do a podcast uh, talking about a serious subject or subjects such as religion or history, I have a duty to try to get my facts straight and correct myself when I err. So that was basically it. I accidentally used the phrase books of Genesis instead of um, the book of Genesis, uh, which I believe is comprised of 50 chapters. Uh, chapters, not books. I think I was conflating the terms uh, books of the Old Testament and book of Genesis in my temporarily confused brain for some reason. But anyway, enough of my neuroses and on to the theme of the show. Hidden hands. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, if you've been listening to the podcast or even as you could probably surmise from the title and tagline of the podcast, I'm a um, skeptic or uh, agnostic at best, atheist at worst, and I seriously doubt the existence of a personal creator god, a kind of uh, self-aware sentient deity that intentionally created the universe and monitors all of creation and our actions. And I view all religions as basically being man-made and believe that uh, even though the universe is a big mysterious place that uh, no religion has a monopoly on the truth or you can't find any definitive answers or empirical truths about how we got here, how life began, how the universe came to be um, in a religious text. At the best, you're going to find a mix of mythology, um, moral parable, uh, etc. But you're not going to find any empirical evidence. And uh, I don't believe that with all the multiple concepts of God that are out there, that any religion uh, has it right or has a monopoly on the truth, as I said. That being the case, as I also said, the universe is a big mysterious place and uh, all of us have probably had uh, the feeling that maybe at times we're being helped along or that um, maybe things have fallen into place for us or that experience of having some kind of meaningful coincidence and in a way that kind of falls into the subject of the transcendent, which I already talked about at length in at least one episode and here and there in other episodes, and how I 
deeply believe, uh, well, I think it's, it's a fact that we all have tr- quote unquote transcendent experiences, feelings that maybe we've temporarily risen above the normal mode of consciousness, or maybe we feel plugged into something bigger than ourselves, or we feel as if we're at one with the universe, uh, that type of thing. But if you've been listening, as you know, I tend to be skeptical about the root of those experiences in the sense that I believe they could just be as easily explained by neuroscience as they could be by a belief in the divine. I believe that those experiences are real and valid, but I don't see any reason why uh, we have to turn to a belief in the supernatural to explain them. I think there's a good case to be made that they could be explained chemically and neurologically. If you look at other experiences, um, the runner's high, or even um, the effects of alcohol or illicit drugs, or even, um, hopefully it doesn't sound too crude, the experience of uh, orgasm. Uh, You know, there's all these things where there's a direct correlation between uh, physical causality and um, mental and emotional experience. Uh, So I think it could be, those transcendent experiences could be chalked up to the quote-unquote alchemy of brain chemistry, if you will. But I have to say, honestly, I don't know for sure. And even I, at times, have that feeling that's hard to shake as if um, you're being helped or guided along. Um, You know, it could be something as trivial as maybe you're worried if you're maybe you're having car trouble and you're worried about your car getting you home <laughs> safely while you're traveling down the highway or maybe it's someone battling a terminal illness and making it through to the other side and uh you know there's that sense of um feeling as though someone guided or someone or something guided you through all that but like i said uh that could be chalked up to some kind of chemical or cognitive uh, explanation. Now, even if you don't believe in a creator God, there's still some concepts out there that allow for um, the explanation of hidden hands, you know. There's uh, ideas about collective consciousness or some kind of underlying principle of the of the universe. Um, Things like the the Jungian concept of synchronicity and um, being somewhat of a layman, it would be arrogant of me to say I could easily discount or invalidate those things. I, I tend to be a skeptic in general, as much as I'm fascinated by the supernatural and the uh, quote unquote spiritual So do I doubt the existence of some uh, supposed ground of all being, some collective uh, consciousness or guiding benevolent universal principle or something like that? And and those things, uh, they're all kind of vague, which is one of the reasons why I I tend to doubt them. Uh, And they can't really seem to be solidly proven by scientific method or observation. But still, like I said, it would be arrogant to uh, discount them wholesale. And actually, one of my favorite thinkers and authors is Joseph Campbell. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but as I said, he was an author and he was also a professor and lecturer. And he had a deep love of mythology and symbols. And one of his most famous works, which I think I read at a relatively young age, was entitled The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And you may also know him or not from an epic um, TV interview he did with 
Bill Moyers, and it was entitled Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth. And I call it epic because I, I believe it's broken into parts. I think roughly five parts, each one probably at least an hour long or something like that. So it's quite the extensive interview. And uh, he was also known for uh, his famous quote, follow your bliss. And I guess that was advice that he would give to his students. He would talk about, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, trying to sum up his philosophy, but that you should find out what you love in life and basically pursue it. And that's when you really feel the most alive or satisfied. And maybe even in his view, that's when those hidden hands will be working with you the most. And I actually want to read an excerpt from the interview I mentioned where Bill Moyers asks him about uh, hidden hands. Bill Moyers, do you ever have the sense of being helped by hidden hands? Joseph Campbell, all the time. It is miraculous. I even have a superstition that has grown on me as a result of invisible hands coming all the time. Namely, that if you do follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while, waiting for you. And the life that you ought to be living is the one you are living. When you can see that, you begin to meet people who are in your field of bliss, and they open doors to you. I say, follow your bliss and don't be afraid, and doors will open where you didn't know they were going to be. And to me, that's really powerful stuff. And uh, I guess that's where I'm kind of at loggerheads with myself, that sometimes I'm easily seduced by um, stuff like that, and, it's, and yet it's diametrically opposed to uh, my rather skeptical and uh, reason-based view of the world. Um, but I think in fairness, if I was going to argue for that kind of belief in hidden hands and stuff like that, um, even though I tend to, at the end of the day, kind of chalk it up to brain chemistry, et cetera, as I said before, rather than the divine working through us or through the world, you could say, well, since we seem to experience those things, uh, maybe we shouldn't be too quick to dismiss them. I think similarly, like my belief about the transcendent, even though I'm a skeptic about where those experiences come from, I still think those experiences are never the less valid and experientially they're, they're quite real because they're authentic. We experience them firsthand uh, within ourselves. Maybe I should be um, more lenient even with uh, that hidden hands type of mentality and, and ha have a similar outlook, I suppose, that no matter whether there's really hidden hands interfering or not, that experience of feeling as if you're being guided or whatever is still authentic in a sense. And so that's something I'm still wrestling with in myself. And maybe uh, what I'm saying is even confusing because you can hear me. Um, you can hear the two halves of me uh, clashing over this. My reason-based view, analytical view of things. Um, and um, maybe a little, on the other hand, the... Uh, the mystic and the poet and the romantic in me and trying to reconcile those two halves without losing face, I should add. And that is not always an easy task. Uh, I should say that as far as Joseph Campbell's view of religion goes, even though he did seem to embrace this kind of collective consciousness idea and this idea of hidden hands, he seemed to have a kind of rational view about religion believing that um, is basically all symbolism and parable. And if you go back and watch that um, series, I was, that interview series I was talking about, The Power of Myth, you'll even see him quite adamantly 
talking to Bill Moyer. I think Bill Moyer is, is a practicing Christian, or at least was at the time, but probably still is. And there was a little bit of tension between them because um, I think Joseph Campbell said he didn't believe in an actual resurrection. He didn't believe that uh, the Virgin Mary literally ascended into heaven as uh, which I think um, it's a point Richard Dawkins uh, makes sometimes is that uh, nowhere in the Bible does it talk about Mary um, ascending into heaven, but that's kind of church doctrine, which was uh, forged later on and, and then became um, an accepted part of uh, Christian or at least Catholic dogma. Uh, so Joseph Campbell um, didn't seem to believe in religion literally, and yet he did seem to have that kind of spiritual uh, view of things as far as um, some kind of ground of all being or some kind of hidden hands at work. And I think we just found the drinking game for the week. It's hidden hands. Uh, whenever you hear me say hidden hands, take a drink. Just kidding. But that's just an ongoing inside joke I make uh, whenever I seem to repeat a word or a phrase too much. I say it could be a drinking game. But uh, anyway, but I would definitely highly recommend uh, watching The Power of Myth with uh, Bill Moyers and Joseph Campbell. Um, I, I believe, well, I don't believe, I know. They also made a book version of it. I remember because they used to always... Uh, try to hawk it on PBS. <laughs> I mean, it's it's worth getting, I'm sure, but it's basically the transcript to the uh, to the video series. So uh, I would, it might you might even be able to find excerpts of the Power of Myth, and who knows, maybe you could find it in its entirety. Probably broken the segments on YouTube, so that's something to look into, or maybe you can find a uh, you know a copy of the book somewhere, but. Uh, it's life-changing stuff. Um, and earlier I alluded to Carl Jung's uh, idea, of, idea of synchronicity. And if you're not familiar, Carl Jung was a prominent psychologist, uh, a pupil, you could say, of Sigmund Freud. And he had uh, these kind of semi-mystical beliefs, kind of built into the foundation of his uh, psychological philosophy, uh, things about a collective unconscious um, and archetypes and uh, synchronicity, this belief about meaningful coincidences. Um, and there's still a lot I have to learn about Jungian psychology, so I don't want to try to get in over my head and uh, trying to over-explain things and find myself out of my wheelhouse. But I think uh, maybe some examples, um, you know, I think we've all had those experiences where you're talking to a friend and out of nowhere you say the same exact thing at the same exact time. Or maybe there's some obscure song you were just talking about with a friend that you don't hear that often that you remember out of nowhere then you flip on the radio and there it is or something like that and i think on face value it can be those experiences can be very seductive and we can tend to want to say that oh you know that's proof of something something's at work um but i guess the skeptic in me would probably say that you know, there's so many variables in life. Uh, our lives are composed of so many events, and the and it probably has to do more with um, probability and just uh, you know the random odds that we say so many words, we do so many things, uh, we have so many thoughts that it makes sense that once in a while. Um, you know, just kind of like um, throwing the arm on a slot machine that you're going to get interesting result. And, you know, if we think about all the times that um, we don't say the same exact thing as someone else and that that uh, maybe we mention an old song we like and it doesn't show up on the radio, you know, it makes sense that once in a while it's going to be some kind of coincidence, just the uh, laws of probability. 
Oh, and there was one important thing, kind of like a moral note I wanted to make about uh, the idea of hidden hands. And I guess this is kind of me playing devil's advocate. Well, since, as I said earlier, uh, I kind of fight with myself about this stuff, and I'm not even sure completely sometimes which side I'm on. Um, but one of my moral critiques of the hidden hands type of feeling in not just you know this kind of vague um collective consciousness or universal principle hidden hands thing but also from a religious um monotheistic view too you know there's that kind of hidden hands type of thing where whether it's someone who survives a terrible accident or someone who wins the super bowl or is uh, receiving a Grammy award or something and you know the first thing they do is thank God or they say you know God must have been with me or looking out for me and obviously uh, and, well I say obviously but I don't think this occurs to everyone what about the people who seem to have been abandoned by those hidden hands you know if um it's like you survive. Uh, I know um, I'm thinking about this because I saw it on a Young Turks uh, episode um, where Cenk Uger, the host of the Young Turks, who's also, uh, I believe he labels himself an agnostic, but, you know, he's skeptical about religion, etc. And he was covering the story of a school shooting and a girl who survived the massacre, you know, um, chalked her survival up to god's intervention that god must have been looking out for and jen kind of wisely uh some people might think harshly pointed out the fact well what about the poor kids that got killed that day you know the people who were massacred um where were, were their hidden hands in a sense where was god for them and it reminds me of uh i think i don't know how long after 9 11 it was but Frontline, I believe it was on PBS, had this special, this documentary called Where Was God on 9-11? And it was actually a rabbi speaking, and he was talking about those people who claim that, you know, they survived 9-11 because God was with them, or God helped them, or whatever. And um, he said, you know, or... Or the people, uh, maybe it wasn't the people who directly survived it, but it could have been people who said uh, they were supposed to be on that plane or one of those planes, but something had diverted them and uh, made them take a different flight or something like that. And they chalked it up to God or someone looking out for them. And he said, you know, that type of thinking is all right, but... Maybe, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but maybe you should explain to the families of those who died on 9-11, either in the buildings or who were trapped in those planes with the terrorists, the, um, the suicide pilots, I guess, as it were. Uh, why were you spared and their loved ones weren't? You know, what's so special about you in a sense? Those hidden hands were looking out for you. But a lot of innocent people died that day. Where were the hidden hands for them? Um, so I think that's kind of the sobering view. And maybe we need to put that into the equation when we're trying to figure out whether those hidden hands are real or not. That, uh, And maybe in a way it's almost like an uh, evolutionary safety mechanism or something like that. Where either, you know, we want to believe we're special, we want to believe that there's something helping us get through, um, you know, survive the vagaries of existence or those uh, ordeals we have to face. But what about all the people every day that don't make it, that don't seem to have those hidden hands? Um, and it seems kind of distasteful, you know, when you think of it that way, to assume that they're there for you but not for the other person. Uh, so that's kind of food for thought. Maybe I'll leave the podcast on that note and you can weigh the different sides and the arguments for yourself and try to decide where you come down on it. Uh, as always, uh, you can like us on Facebook. Um, you can view, uh, and there I go using the uh, royal us, I guess, as it were. It's just me. 
<laughs> with my Mac and my um, my Yeti Blue microphone uh, and GarageBand. But anyway, um, you can go to uh, Podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com and look for The Week in Doubt and um, you become a fan of us that way or subscribe that way or, or see the post. I just said us again. Unbelievable. Um, and I think there may even be a mail, a, a contact uh, option there on Podbean in case you want to either tell me I'm doing a great job or tell me I'm doing a great job, but, or maybe you have criticisms. Um, I'm a relatively sensitive guy, so if you have criticisms, try to couch them uh, gently if you can. <laughs> um, so... That being said, uh, once again, thanks for listening. <laughs>